We've been shaped by stories our entire lives. When we were younger, they were read to us. They are shared by our teachers and friends. We see them in movies and TV shows. We relate to them, visualize them, and share them. Jesus understood this and chose to teach through stories and illustrations. We've been shaped by stories, and these stories told by Jesus were meant to bring us life. These stories are called parables. Well, good morning, church. How are you guys doing? You guys look like you're unsure of how you're doing. Are you guys good? Doing good this morning? Awesome. Awesome. It is good to see you. You guys are looking good. You're looking ready. Yeah, ready for the word. Awesome. My name is Brad, just in case you don't know. And uh, I get to bring the word this morning, and I'm really excited to share what God has just been putting on my heart for the last little while. And so we're, we're just going to start with prayer, and then we'll jump in. God, thank you so much that you want to reveal yourself to us, God. You want to reveal your heart to us. Thank you, God, that you do this, that you speak even today. And, and God, we pray that you do that. Holy Spirit, we just invite you to come and invite you to speak to us this morning. Speak through me and, and speak way beyond me. Yeah, we just open our hearts right now for whatever you want to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Awesome. Well, we're going to be diving into a parable called the parable of the rich fool. Now, some of you are already tuning out because you think, well, I'm not rich, so that doesn't apply to me, right? But before you tune out, I want you to know that this isn't just about money, okay? There's, there's so much that we can learn from this. Jesus is teaching some really valuable life principles, and I think that we can learn a lot. So let's jump in together in Luke 12. We're going to start in verse 13, and we're going to go all the way through to verse 21. Just before we start reading, I want to set the context up for you just a little bit. So Jesus is talking to a crowd of many thousands of people. That's how the Bible words it, many thousands of people. Do you ever wonder, this is just random thoughts from Brad, but do you ever wonder, how did his voice project that far without a, like a PA system? Like we've got this great PA system, right? But, but how did his voice project that far? I don't know, just a random question that I asked myself. Maybe it was like this divine projection that he had. I, I, I imagine it was awesome. But Jesus is talking to this crowd of thousands of people. And, and they, they, they're gathering around, they're hungry for what he has to say, and he's just teaching about hypocrisy and different things like that. And then this guy comes up and just completely interrupts him. And that's where we're going to start. Verse 13, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, I'm just going to pause here for a second. Like I said, this guy, he's completely interrupting Jesus, right, in the middle of his teaching. He wasn't talking about inheritances. Jesus wasn't teaching about inheritances. And so he, he's not only interrupting, but he's changing the subject. Talk about rude, right? This, this guy's kind of rude. That would be like if somebody here would just stand up and be like, hey, Brad, hang on. Before you preach anymore, I want you to tell my husband to stop leaving his socks lying around. Right? Like, that's, that's basically how rude this is. Or, or maybe it would be, tell my wife to stop telling me to leave my socks not lying around. <laughs> Whatever. Right? So th this guy is interrupting Jesus. And I, I, think it's, I think it's cool to understand, too, why he's interested, why he's so concerned about his estate. Now, they used to, in, in, in ancient Israel, in their culture, they used to divide their estate differently than a lot of us probably would now. So the oldest son would actually get two shares of the estate, of the inheritance. And so the others would actually just kind of divide the rest, any oldest in the family here? Any firstborns? Raise your hands. Firstborns? Yeah, okay. It's good to be you in ancient Israel, right? It's good to be you. You would have gotten like a double portion. Hopefully that's the case for you anyway, right? <laughs> the rest of us, I mean, life is just hard, especially if you're a middle kid like me, right? Middle kids, anyone? Middle kids, life is just hard all the time, right? Oh, man. The forgotten middle child. That was me, middle of five, forgotten most of the time. Just kidding. 
But did you know, okay, middle kids, I, I, I'm relating to you right now. I feel like we've got this cool vibe going on, which is really fun. Um, I want to tell you guys all something, okay? August 12th, make sure, yes, August 12th is Middle Child Day. Man, that's exciting. We're like 10 days away from Middle Child Day, guys. I, I imagine that, that my family's probably going to throw me a party, and it's going to be amazing, and we're going to have this giant celebration. Some of you are shaking your heads, and some of you are like, what is Middle Child Day? I had no idea that existed. Wow, I'm so surprised that you forgot or didn't realize. <laughs> anyway, wow. Giving you some context, but I won't do that with every verse, I promise. We're going to continue. We're going to continue in verse 14. Jesus replied, man, man, like, who appointed me judge or an arbiter between you? He's saying, I, I'm not your judge, I'm not your lawyer. And then, he, and then he says, watch out. He turns back to the crowd and he continues to teach. He says, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And there I'll store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, self, <laughs> you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, be merry. This guy is all into talking to himself, right? Um, but, but I think, he, yeah, eat, drink, be merry. That's what this guy is, is saying to himself. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then, who will get what you've prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. I, I love watching how Jesus interacts with people. You know, he, he, whether it's a question or somebody interrupting him, I, I love watching his response, watching his answers to people. And, and in this parable, like so many parables, Jesus takes this opportunity to talk about a character problem, to talk about a heart issue. Jesus always wants to grow our character. That's the first thing that I, wanna, I want us to catch this morning from this, this text. Jesus always wants to grow our character. And that's the point, right? This guy, he, he interrupts Jesus and, and, and he says, Jesus, can you help me fix my money problem but, but he, Jesus knew his heart condition, right? Jesus knew that the heart of the problem was actually a problem of the heart. And he saw this greed in this man's heart. And he said, I want to fix your, I'm interested in your problem, but I, I want to take aim at your heart first. Have you, ever, have you ever seen God use a problem in your life to reveal a problem that you might have in your heart? Have you ever seen God do that? I've seen God do that in a lot of different ways. One little way, um, just recently actually, um, was the, the problem was with my minivan, actually. We, we drive a minivan, we love our minivan, it's great, except for one thing. The air conditioning doesn't work all the time. <laughs> this is a big problem, right? I mean, have you guys been driving around in plus 30 temperatures like me? I mean, God is, is building my character in these moments when I'm driving around in plus 30 temperatures and the air conditioning isn't working all the time. And God is revealing a condition in my heart because my air conditioning isn't working. And he's saying, God, Brad, you need to be more patient, right? And he's really revealing that in my heart. I'm not a very patient person sometimes. And so that's just been something he's been working on in me in different ways, some obviously more serious. This is kind of a silly little illustration, but I, but I think God is, is really more interested in our character than in our comfort, isn't he? Right? Seriously, there, there's a lot of us, we've gone through some, some really tough, stretching seasons in life. And, and we know what this means, right? From, from little things like this to really, really big things. That, that God uses to teach us. God can always use these stretching and uncomfortable things to grow our character. You know, the, the reality is that just like physical muscles have to stretch in order to grow, our, our spiritual muscles have to stretch in order to grow too, right? Sometimes to the point of pain, right? 
physical muscles in order to grow, often you have to stretch them to the point of pain. At least for me, almost everything hurts when I start working out or anything, right? Almost everything hurts. And some of you enjoy working out. That's good. Good for you. Um, But physical growth, right, requires stretching. It requires pain. And, and, And spiritually, we are the same way. We're wired this way. And God loves to use these opportunities to grow our character. So I want to ask you this question this morning. Which part of your character is God working on right now? Which part of your character? A good way to, a good way to find out is which part of your life is, is tough right now. What's a problem in your life, right? This is probably an area that God wants to use to grow your character. He, he's so interested in growing our character, and he wants to help us do that. That's the first thing, okay? The second thing that we should catch is that Jesus is using this parable to tell us that life is not about me. Life is not about me. How many of us maybe find that a little bit hard to hear? You don't have to raise your hand, but but we find that a little bit hard to hear, that life is not about me. It's not about me. Oh, in this parable, Jesus, he, he describes this guy whose greatest pursuit, his, his every goal in life was all about himself, right? If we read it, we can see he thought to himself, what shall I do? What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. This is what I'll do. I will tear, you know, it's all about himself. Take life easy, eat, drink, be merry. There's like 10 personal pronouns or more personal pronouns in this passage. This guy was only focused on building up his own life and his own wealth and, and so that he could kick back and be comfortable. Now, I, I don't think, first of all, I just want to say, I don't think that Jesus is saying you shouldn't own anything or you shouldn't save anything. I don't think that's what he's saying. If you didn't catch it, in the first line of the parable, it actually says that this guy was already rich before he had this bumper crop. And so it wasn't about what he did, it was about what he neglected to do. He neglected to make life more about than just himself, right? It was all about his possessions. He allowed his possessions to make him self-centered. You know, he was just striving for his own version of the American dream, right? He, he was caught in this rat race, and his number one goal was to accumulate enough, right? He invested his whole life into something that was temporal and would not last. He had an abundance, yet he wasn't generous, right? And so by teaching this parable, Jesus is showing us a picture of self-centeredness and greed, and he's saying, he's using this to tell us, don't be like this. This guy was living a life that was all about himself, and he's using this parable to say, don't live like this. And then he begins to create and, and show us this amazing contrast, and he begins to say in verse 21, he begins to show us what life really is about. He, he gives us that in, in the last verse of that parable. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. We are called to strive to be rich toward God. Another way to say that is that life is about being God-centered and not self-centered. God wants our everything, right? Right? If we continue to read through this chapter of Luke 12, Jesus goes on to say, you don't need to worry. God takes care of the birds. He takes care of the flowers of the fields. How much more won't he take care of us? So we don't need to spend our entire lives striving for that. He says instead, in verse 31, he says, but seek his kingdom and these things will be given to you as well. In Matthew, he, Matthew records a very similar statement in Matthew 6, 33. It says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. So again, Jesus is just saying there's so much more to life than this busyness, than this grind of the day-to-day, trying to provide for ourselves and for our families and worrying about all of this stuff and how much we have to do and, and, and how comfortable our retirement will be. Life is more than that. It doesn't mean that we can't do any of those things, but it is more than that. That should not be our primary focus, right? It's about seeking God's kingdom. 
And God's kingdom means shifting our focus to a focus of it's all about, God, what do you want to do in me and what do you want to do through me? It's that simple. If you really simplify the kingdom of God, it's that simple. What do you want to do in me and what do you want to do through me? It's about God-centered instead of self-centered, right? It's about aligning our hopes, our dreams, our desires with God's desires for us. How many of us have to be reminded of that pretty much every day, right? Man, like aligning my hopes, my dreams, my desires with what God has for my life. That's what this parable is teaching us. It's saying live with an eternal perspective Focus on the eternal more than the physical, right? Because the kingdom of God is eternal. The kingdom that we build here for ourselves is not, right? And so we we desperately, as a people, I, I really believe I need this, and I think we all need this so desperately. We need to somehow maintain this eternal perspective and allow God to transform our lives with that eternal perspective, right? I know for myself, this has been an ongoing journey, right? This has been an ongoing journey of surrendering my own will and saying, God, I I want what you want for me even more than I want what I want for myself, right? And I'm so far from done learning this. And even as I was preparing this message, I I felt like I was asking God, like, God, is there some stuff that that you want me to align my perspective with you again? And, And he showed me stuff again just this week. And it was like, he didn't condemn me, but he, he started to convict me of, God, uh, Brad, your, your, your perspectives aren't aligned with me in this area. And that's kind of how God does it. So I want to ask you a question this morning. Do you live with an eternal perspective? Do you live with an eternal perspective? And if you're not sure and, and you want to know, I, I, ask, I, I invite you to ask yourself this. What consumes most of your thoughts? What consumes most of your time, your energy, your talents, your resources? What consumes most of it? I think that's often going to reveal which kingdom we're building into, right? What, what am I striving for most in life? Is it, is it my degree? Is it my job, my promotion, my house, my cars, the next toy, the next big thing, whatever it is for you? You know, is that what I'm striving for? Is God's kingdom one of many lenses that I see life through or is God's kingdom the lens that everything else comes around, right? I remember so clearly um, about eight and a half years ago when God really dramatically realigned my perspective of life. Um, It was about eight and a half years ago that my oldest brother died suddenly in a car accident. And, and obviously, this was the most difficult thing that, that me or my family had ever been through, and um, just one of the toughest seasons of life in so many ways. Um, he had three kids, and so suddenly I became this kind of stand-in dad to these three kids, and I wasn't a father at the time yet, and there was so much going on, um, and, and this was such a tough season in so many, so many ways. And I remember so clearly, though, that in the midst of all of these raw emotions, what I was feeling in all of this was how extremely real eternity felt. Because God was really opening my eyes in a really fresh way that life after death is so real, right? Life after death is so real. What better way, what, what, what more effective thing to, to help us understand what an eternal perspective is than to understand that life after death is a real thing. And I started to realize in a whole new way that this life on earth is really about preparing for the life to come. Suddenly, I started to see my desires change. I started to see that keeping up with with the Joneses, keeping up with my friends, um, you know, advancing my career, increasing my income, that, that was all stuff that was starting to fade. It started to fade and, and striving for my version of the American dream, it just started to fade. And I started to, to God kind of, in a, in a dramatic way, made me come alive to him and his kingdom. And it was all about, God, what do you want to do in me? 
And what do you want to do through me? And again, this, this is such a journey, like it's, it's an ongoing thing, and I'm so far from done learning this. But, but this, was, this was a time where it was just a, a refreshing, uh, it, it was a refreshed perspective that God wanted me to align with. And so I, I remember just being really, uh, feeling an urgency for the kingdom of God in just a new way, right? The harvest is ripe. And, and I remember it impacted the way that I spent my time, the way that I was involved in church, the way that I spent my, my money, even my willingness to use my gifts, right? And so God gave me a fresh revelation of what this life is really about. The Bible calls it storing up treasures in heaven. I love it. In, in Matthew 6, verse 19 to 21, it says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Man, I, I, we could do a whole sermon on just that, right? Like talk about a valuable understanding. Our values are going to determine our direction, right? Our values are going to determine what we strive for. That's such a huge truth. So there's, there's nothing wrong, I, I want to say it again, there's nothing wrong with providing for ourselves or saving for retirement. But the problem, when it becomes a heart condition, is when we let our focus of having things here on earth take away and consume us to the point where we actually can't be consumed by the things of God. Does that make sense? Yeah. So... We have to maintain this eternal perspective. I, I want to show you guys a blank slide. I want to show you a blank slide. And I, I want to play a little game with you, okay? Find the speck. Can you find the speck? Just when you thought it was just a blank slide. There's a speck. Have most of you found the speck? Okay. Which side is it on? Just so I know you're not cheating. Okay. It's more on the left side. Yeah. And some of you OCD people are like, Man, that really bothers me that it's not dead center. I know for me, that was a big deal. I was like, man, Chuck, we should just put that speck right in the center. And Chuck was like, no, let's put it off to the side. <laughs> Different personalities, right? Anyway, not the point at all. What I want to just show you guys is just a little illustration of how our, uh, this speck represents our life in relation to the rest of eternity. Of course, we have to imagine this screen is eternally large. And it goes from north to south, and it, and it extends forever, right? And our life is like this speck on this screen. And in, in relation to eternity, it's just such a small part of the picture, right? And so why do I spend most of my time thinking about this little speck? I'm consumed by this little speck, right? I'm consumed about how comfortable I can make myself on this little speck, and, and how I can live the American dream in this little speck, right? But it's only such a small part of the big picture. We're, we're, we're called to focus our time here on earth into storing up treasures in heaven. Let's, let's maintain that, that, that bigger, greater perspective, right? Colossians 3, 1 to 3 says it this way. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above where Christ is, Seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Setting our minds on things above, not on earthly things. That's what we're called to, right? We want to be a kingdom-focused church, right? We want to be kingdom-focused individuals that come alive to God, that come alive to his kingdom, and, and having, I, I really believe the reason this is so important is because, like I said earlier, what happened for me was that it changed everything. And, and I think this, it, it changes everything. Having this kingdom perspective changes everything because our, our perspective is going to change and transform. It's going to impact every part of our life, the way that we spend our, our time, our energy, our money, it's going to increase our ability to love God and others with all of our life. Does that make sense? Kind of sounds like the great commandment, right? The greatest two commandments. Love God, love others. And I think if we can grab a hold of this, 
We're going to begin to love God and others with our time, with our talents, with our resources. And, and this can look a lot of different ways, right? We know that. It could be volunteering. It could be buying someone a meal. It could be investing your, your talents, your resources, and your time into the mission of the local church, right? And, and beyond, of course. And so this is what building God's kingdom is about. This is what we should be striving for in our lives more than anything. And so I, kn- I know that this is, this is a very simple truth, but I think it's such an important reminder, right? Because if you're like me, man, I, I so quickly become selfish again. You know, in my human nature, in my flesh, I'm just selfish. And so we need this reminder. Am I living? Am I striving for the kingdom of God more than myself, right? Let's not let this day-to-day grind of, of, of life and the pursuit of our comfort and all of that take away from our ability to sow into the kingdom of God generously. So this is not a message of condemnation, okay? Um, I, I think this is an ongoing transformation of our hearts that Jesus is calling us to. And I think that we're all on this journey. And, and I understand that, that God, he, he convicts, but he doesn't condemn, right? And so he wants to walk with us. He wants to convict us, but he wants to walk with us in this journey of becoming God-centered instead of self-centered. I, I've fallen so many times going back into my own ways of striving for my own stuff, right? It's hard not to fall back into striving for a new minivan, right? I mean, that's, that's the reality, right? Um, just kidding, there's nothing wrong with new vehicles. <laughs> but his, he, with God's, God brings conviction, but with his conviction, he extends his grace over and over. I, I love that about God. His grace is so amazing, This is my last thought for you this morning. I don't want you to miss it. This is probably the most important part of anything I'm going to say. If we're actually going to truly change our perspective to align with God's perspective, if we're going to be focused on the kingdom of God, if we're really going to do this and live this out, we have to draw near to the king. If we're going to seek his kingdom, then we have to start by seeking the king. By giving us this calling to seek his kingdom, Jesus is inviting us to draw near in relationship to him. That's where it begins. That's That's where it all starts. So God wants to be with us. He wants us to draw near, and he draws near to us. Isn't that amazing that God wants to be with us? Isn't that amazing that he wants to be with you? Like, I find that incredible. You know, if I look at the Bible, if I look at Genesis to Revelation, I I see this amazing love story of a God who wants so badly to be with his people. You know, A, a God who wants so badly to bring his people into reconciliation with him. That that's the God that we're seeking. He loves us so deeply. And so if if we're going to do this, if we're going to love God and others the way that we're called to, it has to start in relationship. Jesus wants to walk with us in this. What I love, what I love is that we have full access to Holy Spirit all the time. Isn't that amazing? We have full access to Holy Spirit, the greatest teacher of all time, better than any self-help book that we will ever read Holy Spirit can teach us so much, whether that's through the Word of God or whether that's through a rhema or whether that's through speaking through someone else. Holy Spirit speaks in so many ways, but he wants to, he wants to lead us if we're open. He wants to adjust our heart condition to maintain a God-centered life if we're open. And so, so my prayer is, and, and I hope this is your prayer too, God, how do you want to change my perspective? How do you want to change my perspective? God, open my eyes to see you and the needs of others around me. Show me how you want to use me. Show me how you want to use me. I'm open to your perspective. And I'm open to relationship with you. Amen? 
I want to just give you an opportunity this morning just to, just to realign yourself with God's perspective. I know a lot of us, we've been Christians for a long time, and, and we've, we've, we've been aligned to God's perspective, and, and, and yet sometimes it's so easy, like I said, to slip back into that, that self-centered way of living and striving for our own stuff, building our own treasures instead of God's, right? And if so, it, it, this morning, if you just want to close your eyes and respect for your neighbor, and if you just, I want to give you the opportunity just to, just to ask God for a fresh revelation of his perspective in your life. If that's, if that's you, if that's what you want this morning, you just want to raise your hand as a symbol of your agreement to this truth. God, I want to take your perspective. I want a refreshed revelation of your perspective yet again. If that's you, just raise your hand this morning. I want to be refreshed with your perspective, God. I need it again. Huh. I need it again and again. We just, God, we, we, we turn our hearts to you this morning. We turn our hearts to you, God. We say we want you. We want your perspective. God, help us not to be selfish. We're, we're sorry for all the times that we live striving only for ourselves. And we go through life and, and, and all of our goals, our hopes, dreams, and desires are all about me. God, sorry for when we do that. Father, I pray that you would bring a fresh revelation of your perspective. Help me to be, help me to be on fire for what it is that you want to do, God. What you want to do in me, what you want to do through me. Help me to, help me to just be ignited. Help me to be on fire and passionate about these things, God, about seeking your kingdom. Yeah. Father, I pray your blessing on each person here this morning. Father, would you fill them with your grace? Would you fill them with your love? Yeah. In Jesus' name, amen.